Hi folks, welcome back to 3 Minute Tales. This is the She Bean and I'm your storyteller Shanna Key. Now, today's story is an Irish one, so I was really able to get my teeth into this. It's a little bit long, so I'll spare you the details. It really revolves around the brutality and the treatment of a young Irish family in rural Cork by the Black and Tans. So, whether he gets justice or revenge, I'll let you be the judge. So please sit back, enjoy. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to leave a comment or a message, you can do so down below. And again, as I said, if you haven't already hit that subscribe button, please do so. It doesn't cost a penny. Just hit the subscribe button and click on the little notification bell. So every time we upload, you're notified. Happy days. So until the next time, thanks so much for your time. I'm Shanna Key. In the early 1900s, after enduring almost 800 years of British occupation, civil unrest in Ireland was at an all-time high. The outlawed Irish Republican Brotherhood, who would later become the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, were a guerrilla-style army made up of Irish patriots who opposed British rule. Their endeavour was to drive the British out of Ireland and establish a home-ruling Free State Republic. The police force who controlled Ireland at the time were the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary. A police force comprised of British and Irish men who were loyal to the British Crown. When attacks on the RIC from Republican forces became more frequent and widespread, a group of army reserves were assembled in England and dispatched to Ireland by the British Secretary for War, Winston Churchill, in January 1920 to assist the RIC keep law and order. This group of unruly mercenaries consisted of ex-First World War soldiers, career criminals and recently released violent prisoners who were only too happy to sign up to the force with the promise of a handsome wage. Their improvised uniforms consisting of dark green which appeared black and a pale khaki colour soon earned them the nickname the Black and Tans. On arrival in Ireland, over 10,000 of them were given orders to shoot anyone, armed or unarmed, who they found suspicious. And so began a reign of terror, the likes of which had never been seen before on Irish soil. This group of men were to act as protection for the RIC against Republican attacks, and given carte blanche freedom to act in whatever way they chose to. Lacking the restraint of the well-trained RIC, they soon began to garner a reputation for brutal, lawless and violent thuggery. They were also instructed to evict any civilians whom they suspected of being sympathetic to the Republican cause and commandeer the vacant houses for themselves. Within a short amount of time, the Black and Tans had been responsible for the rape of hundreds of Irish women, arson attacks on innocent families and businesses, illegal evictions, theft and countless cold-blooded murders of Irish civilians. Their infamous reputation preceded them, and whenever the Black and Tans were mentioned, it was enough to send shivers up the spines of all who heard their dreaded name. On a small farm, three miles north of McCroom in County Cork, lived a 34-year-old tenant farmer named Michael Barry. He lived there with his 29-year-old wife Maura, 6-year-old son Brian and their baby daughter Eilish. The young farmer eked out a meagre living, raising pigs and growing crops on their small 4-acre farm and although poor, the young family were more than content. During the afternoon of March 1st 1920, Michael Barry had made his way to nearby McCroom to procure provisions for his family. As he bartered some vegetables as part exchange for some flour and buttermilk in the town, three members of the Black and Tans happened upon his small, isolated, three-roomed cottage. Recently discharged First World War soldier, 29-year-old Charles Ackerman, 31-year-old Lenny Barber and Peter Norris, a 44-year-old career criminal, were among the most notorious violent members of the Black and Tans who were stationed in County Cork. With the butt of his rifle, Peter Norris banged heavily on the wooden door of the cottage. Inside, a terrified Maura Barry hid her young son Brian under her bed 
and put baby Eilish in one of the drawers of a wooden dresser in the bedroom. She could hear the enraged roars of the three soldiers outside and ran to the front door in an attempt to secure it by wedging a stool against it. But to no avail, the three men burst through the door and barged into the cottage. The sparse interior of the small house did not impress the three men who immediately began to thrash the tiny kitchen. Hysterical, Maura pleaded with them to stop, but her pleas went unheeded. Charles Ackerman, who was quite drunk, kicked open the door of the bedroom before entering. Maura chased after him, fearing for the safety of her children. His two accomplices followed her into the bedroom and when inside, Norris punched Maura in the face, knocking her to the ground. Dazed, she glanced under her bed and could see a terrified Brian shaking with fear. Before she could say anything, Norris dragged her off the floor and threw her onto the bed. Ackerman and Barbara laughed as they watched Norris pull down his trousers. Maura screamed as Norris pulled at her clothing and violently pulled her dress and undergarments off. He then set upon the hapless young woman and viciously raped her on her marital bed. The whole episode was over within minutes and as the other two cheered on their brutal colleague, Norris laughed and pulled his trousers back up. Maura, who was left sobbing on the bed, was then brutally beaten by Ackerman and Barber, as Norris ransacked the kitchen in search of valuables. Before fleeing the cottage, the three tugs kicked over the stove, setting fire to the kitchen. Inside the bedroom, a petrified brain attended to his unconscious mother, before fleeing the bedroom through a tiny window. As the three tugs made their escape over the hill adjacent to the farm, Brian ran to their nearest neighbour and secured the assistance of another farmer, Tom Kelly, and his teenage sons, Liam and Cormac. They ran to the farmhouse, but the small cottage was up in flames. The farmer bravely ran into the house and managed to retrieve both Maura and baby Eilish. But unfortunately, both mother and child had succumbed to the effects of the smoke from the fire, and they sadly passed away on the cold gravel of the farmyard. When Michael returned home to his farm, he was left devastated by the news of his wife and baby daughter. A traumatised Brian who had witnessed the attack was unable to speak or tell anyone what had happened. When the RIC eventually arrived at the scene, foul play was quickly ruled out and the fire and the deaths of both mother and daughter were recorded as a tragic accident. When Michael Barry pressed for a doctor to examine and explain the severe bruising to his wife's face, it was implied by the investigating officer that they were probably the result of a previous beating inflicted on Maura by Michael himself. An outrageous claim that didn't sit well with anyone who knew the mild-mannered and loving family man. Meanwhile, at the barracks of the Black and Tans, Lifer, Ackerman, Barber and Norris went on as usual. They continued to terrorise the local community, often accompanied by as many as 20 other out-of-control soldiers. It took Michael Barry almost three months to repair the damage to his small cottage and with his life now in ruins, he was tortured and perplexed by what had happened to his young family. Brian, who had been completely traumatised by the ordeal, had not uttered a single word since the tragic event. But in early May, during a fitful sleep, the young boy began speaking aloud. Michael thought that his son was just having a nightmare, but when Brian spoke of the bold men hurting his mammy, Michael became suspicious. He woke the child from his slumber and hugged the little boy. A whimpering Brian told his horrified father the details of the terrifying event. The following day, Michael, accompanied by his neighbour Tom Kelly, brought his young son to the nearby RIC barracks. There he lodged a complaint and demanded that an investigation should begin to find the perpetrators of the heinous murder of his wife and infant daughter. But with only the testimony of a traumatised child to go on, Michael Barry was dismissed by the police and told to return to his farm and forget about it. As a devastated Michael left the barracks, his son suddenly froze as he caught the sight of three approaching black and tan soldiers. Michael was baffled and stared at his son. He could tell that his son was truly panic-stricken and Michael suspiciously took great stock of Ackerman, Barber and Norris's faces. As the weeks went by, Michael tried to allay any fears that the boy might have about the bold men returning to the farm. Shortly after 11pm on the night of Saturday, the 18th of July, a drunken Charles Ackerman 
stumbled out of the duck and geese public house and lit up a cigarette before walking towards his barracks as he stumbled unsteadily into the darkness and with his speech slurred he sang the words of the song keep the home fire burning he was never seen again two weeks later just after midnight in a quiet laneway of the town an inebriated thirty-one-year-old lenny barber stopped in the darkened doorway of a shop to relieve himself as he urinated against the shop door a shadow was cast from behind him drunkenly he slowly turned to see the source of the shadow exhaling the smoke from his cigarette into the night air barber never appeared for duty the next morning and was reported missing after three days his superiors declared him absent without leave and believed that he had deserted his post brian although still devastated by the death of his mother and baby sister had returned to school and had settled back into life as normal michael kept a close eye on his son concerned that any little thing might further traumatize the youngster they both visited the grave of maura and baby eilish every day and would pray for their souls so that they may rest in peace as autumn approached michael and brian tried desperately to adjust to life without their loved ones but it was painfully difficult and as christmas drew nearer the pain of losing maura and eilish was never far away at the local barracks in mccroom another member of the black and tans had disappeared peter norris had been reported missing after a night out and was believed to have absconded however a suspicious ric officer insisted that all avenues of the three missing men's disappearance should be explored casting his mind back to a claim made in july by a local farmer that three black and tans were responsible for the murder of his wife and child a decision was made to search the farm of michael barry for any evidence that might link him to the disappearance of the soldiers a squadron of ric officers arrived at michael barry's farm the next day and without any prior warning michael was shocked to see 20 plus men searching his farmyard they then entered his small cottage and told him that they were there to look for evidence of the missing three black and tan officers as the men scoured the house a call went out that one of the RIC policemen outside had found a small brass badge from the beret belonging to the Black and Tans that was covered in soot. Michael was immediately arrested and brought to the barracks on suspicion of murder. Meanwhile, a petrified brain was taken into the care of Tom Kelly's family as the troops dragged Michael from the cottage. Almost a week went by before Michael was eventually represented by a kindly and influential barrister called john h thornton thornton had heard of the farmer's plight and deciding to help out the young farmer he met with michael barry in prison who pleaded his innocence in earnest in fact so watertight were michael's alibis for the nights of the soldier's disappearance that his court case only lasted three days when questioned about the brass badge that had been found on his property michael said that he had found it in mccroom and had discarded it in or around his farmyard at a later date on christmas eve 1920 michael barry was acquitted of all charges he continued to live on the farm where he raised brian single-handedly and in 1935 after extending their tiny cottage brian married his fiancee bridget comiskey and the happy couple moved in together to both farm and care for his father michael who was now in failing health on the 22nd of October 1951, Brian summoned the local priest to administer the last rites to his 67-year-old dying father. As Brian, his wife and the priest sat by his bedside, Michael took hold of the cleric's hand. With tears in his eyes, he begged the priest to absolve him from his sins. Both Brian and the priest sat astonished as Michael recounted how many moons ago, he had patiently and meticulously planned and ambushed the men who had cold-bloodedly murdered his beautiful young wife and baby daughter. He went on to describe how he malevolved them with a shovel, then strangled them to death with his bare hands, castrated the rapist Peter Norris with a fillet knife before feeding their bodies to his pigs, a secret that he had kept from everyone, even his own son. Before passing away, Michael uttered his last words. May the Lord have mercy on my soul.